Hello and welcome to a special episode of Statistically Insignificant. This time it's going to be a podcast about mathematics in particular. It's a special episode because I'm doing it on my own. This particular episode is a version of a talk I gave for the University of Wollongong Math Society and it's pitched at roughly end of first year, hopefully a bit of second year sort of level. So if that's your background in maths, this should be good for you. If you have less background in math, some of this might not be particularly comprehensible. But if it's interesting, you should go and look up the stuff I'm talking about. This talk is about maths as and is a language. So this is a claim that I am making, uh, and I hope by the end of it, I will have convinced you of that fact. Maths as a language is a way of expressing particular ideas and relationships that are abstracted and away from what we normally experience. And this is part of why it's really, really hard. So as a first case study in that, we're going to look at x, this symbol, v. Now, there are many, many different ways of reading this combination of symbols, and that is part of what I want to get at. The simplest one, x in v, describes the relationship of x to something that contains it. There's also x belongs to v, x is a member of v. All of these sorts of English combinations of words that express this fundamental abstract relationship. If I change this slightly, if I put a let out the front, that changes the sorts of things that I would read this as. Let x be a member of v, for example, as opposed to x is in v. Let x be in v could be another one. Let x be an element of v. All of these sorts of things that are kind of adding on the fact that I am setting this to be a state of the world. Let's change it again. Now I am stating this as kind of a question. If x is in v, if x is a member of v, that kind of conditional behavior changes how I read the same set of three symbols here, really. This is a demonstration of the interplay between maths, notation, and English, and that's kind of what I want to talk about here. I want to talk about how maths behaves as a language for expressing stuff, and in particular, what that means for the maths student who is trying to become fluent in that language of mathematics. There are three main parts to this talk. The first one is about notation, the second is about grammar, and the third is about fluency with different objects. So let's talk about notation. So notation in mathematics I'm taking to be any symbol or combination of symbols that we use to represent an idea. These might be objects, relationships, or operations. And broadly those are three kinds of things that we have in maths. So notation doesn't just show up in mathematics, we have notation in English all over the place. Punctuation is a form of notation. Letters are a form of notation in English. And uh, if people think that mathematical notation is obtuse and difficult to get into, English writing, like how English expresses different phonemes or pr pronunciation with letters, is absolutely fucked. One of the other things that comes up in English, actually, that we don't necessarily think about is the fact that a space between letters indicates a new word. And this is a relatively new phenomenon in English writing. Uh, it didn't show up until, I don't know, some hundreds of years ago, but prior to that it was typically just all strung together. Very difficult to read. So in maths, notation is useful for things like increasing the density of information, uh, making it more efficient so you can pack more information into a given space. It also helps us keep track of objects and be consistent. So if we introduce notation for something Every time we use it, we know that it refers back to the same thing. And here is my first kind of instruction for the student, which is that maths should read like language. You should be able to translate between what you're writing on the page and what you would say if you were telling somebody about it, and how you think about it in your own head. This should be a very uh, staunch guide to how people write assignments in particular, because it is really awful and very hard to read and mark an assignment that is incoherent, that does not flow like language. And if you want to endear yourself to a marker, you should make their job as easy as possible. Maths, once it's been written down, is also frequently non-linear. So what I mean is that the relationships do not flow one after another in a clear order. It's often easiest to communicate mathematics 
when you can show that ordering in time, one of the main reasons that we teach maths by writing it and talking as we are writing is because that time gives us an ordering on the symbols, which makes it much easier to interpret what's going on. I'm going to show you an example here. If you're a regular listener of the show, this will be familiar to you. Also, if you've done statistics, I hope this will be familiar to you. So we're going to use the symbol SP to represent the pooled estimate of standard deviation. So this comes from statistics. And SP is the square root of a whole bunch of stuff. Specifically, it is the square root of NX, which is the sample size from one population that we call X, minus one, multiplied by the variance of that X population. So this is observations from X, and we have the variance of them here, sample variance of them specifically plus n y minus 1, so that is the sample size for y minus 1, times the sample variance for y, divided by n x plus n y minus 2. Now that I have written this, it's nonlinear. So where this square root starts and ends was very difficult to announce yet, and I kind of didn't. Also, where this fraction sits, I didn't really express that at all, aside from to say it's a bunch of stuff and then divide by another bunch of stuff. Exactly what order that is in, not necessarily clear when I said it, but it's much clearer now that it's written down. These parentheses are also really, really hard to enunciate when you're speaking. So, like, it's nx minus 1 times the sample variance of x. It's really hard to tell where that parentheses open and close with that sort of a statement. So let's go through some of the information density here. To the statistician, a lot of this has very specific meaning. For example, where you have sx squared and sy squared, we know those are sample variances. We use the letter s rather than the Greek letter sigma to indicate that they come from a sample and not the values of the population. Also, the subscripts x and y on both this and on like the nx, the sample size, indicate which population the statistics come from. Raising something to a power, right? So you have the superscript here, which is the squaring operation. And we've got a bunch of arithmetic. We've got our plus, our minus, our divide is written like that, where you have something over something else. But we've also got hidden multiplication, specifically here and here. Now this is an interesting bit of notation in mathematics. We hide, we suppress the expression of multiplication because we're kind of combining things when we do it in a way that we take to be creating a new object. So if we go x, y, there is an implicit multiplication in there which creates an object as a whole, x, y, that we don't think of outside of like what we're doing with it, as x times y. This comes up a lot in polynomials, for example. Polynomials and multiple variables specifically, because if you have xy plus x squared y, these are different objects, and you can't just straightforwardly add them together in a way you could in other sorts of arithmetic. I'm also going to pick a bit of a fight here with the physicists, which is to say that you have to be really, really careful with fractions, because... A on B doesn't tell you if it's A, B inverse or B inverse A. And the reason this is a fight that I'm picking with the physicists is because I have seen physicists write something like AB plus AC on A with matrices, which is criminal, realistically, because matrices don't commute. That's kind of the whole deal with matrix multiplication. So which side you put the inverse on really does matter with this. In fact, my honours thesis, which was about the mathematics of quantum mechanics, was basically a whole thing about how actually it's really non-commutative. What does that do? So I have a particular bone to pick with this one. Now, this formula, if I wrote that out as like words and text, would be like half a page. And that's if I didn't include any of the like specific sorts of interpretation stuff I put in and I was writing it, it would also be very, very difficult to translate into an actual formula, precisely because pronouncing where these parentheses go is hard. Working out 
where this division goes is hard, and what these different operations apply to is not very easy to write out in language unless you stick a whole bunch of parentheses in there and colons and things, and it just looks messy and awful. That non-linear structure of this pictogram, I guess you could call it, that I have written here, is a way of conveying relevant information about the maths. And it's something that is very hard to do in natural language. Non-linearity, this density of information and the use of symbols is really important to conveying mathematics in this form, and that's why we use it. Of course, all of those things also contribute to why maths is so hard to read on a page. So if you're trying to translate something from a textbook or a lecture notes or something where it's just there and it's static, this is why we stand up and we write things on a whiteboard or a blackboard, depending on what's available to you. It's also one of the reasons that communicating maths to somebody else is really hard unless you can do it in that kind of time-directed fashion. Also, if you're writing it for yourself, I recommend a whiteboard or blackboard, something where you stand up above trying to do it hunched over on a desk, because when you stand up, you breathe better, and that helps you think. The next thing I want to talk about is grammar and grammatical processes. First, a couple of technical gripes. The initial one is that the tense of maths writing is the present eternal tense. A theorem is true. As it was in the beginning, before we even knew about it, it is true now, and ever shall it be into the future. The second is about pronouns, actually. So this is pronoun discourse. Specifically, in maths, we use the pronoun we. I just did it there, in fact. This is the inclusive you can tell the conservatives will hate it. First person, plural. It is inclusive because it is me, the writer, me, the speaker, me, the author, and the audience. I am taking you on a journey with me along these things. It's why in proof we say, we do this, and then we do that, or we calculate, or we show, because I am taking you with me to do these things, as a way of helping you understand them and as a way of showing you what I'm doing. In older sort of maths writing, you would see one, like the kind of abstract one does these things. That is less common now. Uh, I think it's probably a good change because we is a bit more readable, but that was kind of the formal English that you would use. This doesn't necessarily carry so easily onto other languages. Um, I don't speak or read any other languages of maths, so I can't talk with authority there, but I have been told that the inclusive first person plural is used elsewhere as well. This is distinct from the exclusive first person plural, which is also we in English. Other languages distinguish them a little bit more clearly. This means we the authors. Unfortunately, in English, you just kind of have to work out from context which of these is being meant. It's not necessarily that difficult. So if we're talking about, like, we were motivated to do this in order to explore this other thing, right? That's typically we, the authors, were motivated to do this research as a result of something else. That's distinct from using we in a proof where I'm saying that you and I together are going to do this thing. Now let's talk about grammatical processes. And this is really about different ways of expressing what we are doing in maths and the objects that we're working with. So in our bonus episode about mathematical abstraction, I started by looking at counting, because counting is the first way that we really get introduced to numbers. They are connected to things in the real world. So if you have five mathematicians, for example, this five is describing a noun. So this is acting as an adjective. This is generally how we first get introduced to numbers. They are adjectives. They are describing things in the world. But we don't stay there. Our next step is to take five as an object on its own. This is now a noun. It has properties. It's a number. It's an odd number, specifically. It's positive. It's an integer. And so on. It's prime as well. That's a pretty important one. It also has relationships to other numbers. For example, 5 is equal to 2 times 2 plus 1. Our next step of abstraction is to look at relationships like this. 
We could express this more generally for other numbers as y is equal to 2x plus 1. So now we've gone from 5 as an adjective, 5 on its own as a noun, we've expressed a relationship here, and I'm going to claim that this has a verb running around. Specifically, plus here is a verb. It's doing something. It's adding two things together. But it doesn't stay there, because we can look at plus as a noun. This is treating it like a mathematical object in its own right. So it's an operation. In this case, we're looking at plus as a map from two copies of the real numbers to the real numbers, because it's adding two things together and gives you back something else. It can also be defined as a map over C, because you can have complex addition as well. So these behave slightly differently based on what set you're applying it to. Plus is also commutative, associative, and itself has relationships with other operations. The one that I care about right now is the distribution of multiplication over addition. So if I have z times x plus y, this is equal to z times x plus z times y. Or as we would write it if we're suppressing that multiplication, zx plus zy. So grammatical fluency in maths looks like being comfortable moving between these different levels for talking about things. I am fluent in arithmetic, I hope, so I'm quite comfortable moving between plus as a verb where I'm trying to get an answer out and plus as an operation where I'm talking about its properties as an operation on real numbers, on complex numbers, in relation to other operations. What I want, what I use, depends on what I need at the time, which is a form of fluency that idea of use what you need at the time that I'm going to carry over to what I call object fluency in maths. By object fluency, what I mean is that over time you learn a whole bunch of different ways of describing a given mathematical object. We're going to look at the circle as an example in a second, but in general, what field of maths you're working in, let's call it genre perhaps, or dialect if we're going to look at it from a linguistic perspective, will determine what particular expression you use for a given mathematical object because each one emphasizes different behaviors, different properties or structures within that object. So let's look at the circle. I have four different ways of expressing a circle here. They're not exhaustive. There are shitloads of other ones that you can use if you really want. Our first one is the set x, y as a subset of R2, so each of these is an element of R2, such that x squared plus y squared is equal to 1. Our second, similar idea, x, y in R2, except this time I'm parameterizing with time. So my x is going to be equal to cos of time, my y is going to be equal to sine of time, and I'm going to take the parameter t in the interval 0 to pi, not including 2 pi, so it's open at that end. My third is another expression that's parameterized, but this time it's going to be e to the i theta for theta in the reals. Uh, if you've not done a hell of a lot of complex analysis, this is the unit circle in the complex plane, parameterized by the angle around where zero is the point on the x-axis, on the real axis, sorry. And the fourth is one that some of you may not have met, which is I take the unit interval, zero, one, and I say that I'm going to set zero is equal to one. So I've basically taken the unit interval and attached the ends, giving me a loop. These are quite radically different ways of expressing a circle, and they have quite radically different properties as well. So these first two, are both as subsets of the real plane, so the real line across the real line. This third one is a subset of the complex plane, and this fourth one doesn't live anywhere. There's no ambient space that it exists in. It's just a one-dimensional thing where I've attached the ends up, and that doesn't make any reference to living in a two-dimensional space at all. There are other relationships as well. The second and third Representations are parameterized, whereas this first one is kind of static. These second and third ones have something moving in time or moving as an angle. And this third one is kind of static as well. 
But you can think of how far along the interval you are gives you some idea of how far around the loop you are. In fact, number four gets rid of basically all of the structure that you see in the other two. You have that it's one dimensional. You have that it it's kind of attached up at the end so you can kind of move around it. So I guess there's a hole in the middle. But there's no sense of kind of distance or measurability or anything like that on here. You can kind of measure how far around it you are, but that's it. These different representations of the circle arise because you want to focus on and represent different things. So this first one up here shows up as your classical geometric picture. It arises when you pick all of the points that are some distance from a centre. And you can change what the centre is and what the distance is, but the fundamental relationship of equidistant points from a centre stays. And that's what we express with this relationship here. This second uh, expression, well, that shows up if you're looking at a point moving in time. So this shows up in calculus. Because you can look at the rate of change and the rate of motion around that circle as a way of like parameterizing it with respect to time that you don't get in the static picture. And this third one, oh, that shows up all over the place. So if you restrict theta to 0 to pi, this gives you a group under complex multiplication. For those of you who have not met group theory before, I'm not going to go into a great deal of detail about it. The way you can think about this is that if you take two points on the unit circle in the complex plane and you multiply them together, you get back another point on the unit circle in the complex plane. So it is closed under complex multiplication. There are some other properties and structures, don't worry about it, you'll get to it at some point. If I don't restrict to that, and I look at this parameterization where theta is all of R, what I'm doing is I'm winding around the circle again and again and again and again. And that actually shows up in something like algebraic topology. Other ways that you can think about this are it shows up when you talk about equivalence classes and equivalence relations. So you can have a um, quotient space. You've got R quotiented by Z. What this means is that I am identifying all of the integers and then... So I set them all to be a particular point, and then the real line just kind of loops back and back every time it hits an integer. This last one is a topology picture. And I'm sure somebody in the uh, watching this has cringed when they first saw me write this down. Because I've gotten rid of basically all of the structure here, what I care about is it's one dimensional and it's a loop. So it's got a hole in the middle of it that I cannot kind of shrink the uh, circle down and make disappear because that's not part of the set. This way of thinking also shows up when you've got quotient spaces and equivalence relations in a similar way to e to the i theta uh, because I am making an equivalence here. This is an equivalence relation. That is another way of thinking about it. There are many, many more ways of talking about the circle and as you go forth in mathematics, you'll find various objects that you have, all of these different ways of thinking about them, and you will pick one, depending on what dialect you're speaking at the time. That development to know which one to choose and to be able to fluently identify what the relevant characteristics are, that is part of learning mathematics overall. In fact, you've already done a bunch of it. So I want to go back to our friend y is equal to 2x plus 1. When you first meet something like this in high school, you use it as a verb. You stick in an x and you get out a y. And in fact, that's one way of building up an idea of what this is as a mathematical object, so using it as a noun, to describe a set, which is pairs in the plane, where you have y is equal to 2x plus 1. Now this set is a noun, but the y equals 2x plus 1 aspect of it, well, that's working as an adjective. That's describing the property of the set. So when you move from this form of just getting answers out to thinking about it as producing this set in R2, you're using that original formula as an adjective to define the noun as a whole. So this is a, a common construction 
in languages. So one of the ways you create what's called a noun phrase is that you have some object and then you have a whole bunch of stuff that describes its properties. So one of the more uh, Twitter famous versions of this would be like a green great dragon. So the green great is an adjective phrase that describes the noun, the dragon, but altogether a green great dragon is a noun phrase in its own right. So we do the same thing here. I have built up a noun phrase which describes this set and the adjective of that noun phrase is this y equals 2x plus 1 this relationship between the points. We can go beyond this though. We can turn y equals 2x plus 1 into a function. A function of x specifically. So f of x is equal to 2x plus 1. So this is another verb form because we're doing something. But this is a slightly more abstracted verb form for when we just stick in an x and get a y out, right? Now we're thinking about it in a slightly different way. But we can take the function as a noun. We can go from that verb, it's doing something, and ask, okay, but what are the characteristics of what it's doing? F is a map from the reals to the reals. This is it as a noun. It's affine, which uh, if you've not encountered the word means it's almost linear. It's bijective, and so on. It has a whole bunch of properties as a function that we can lean on. But well, we can go beyond that, right? Because this is kind of a, a function representation. Well, it's not the only representation we can use. If we're looking at the properties of function, it might show up as an example, but we can think of a slightly more advanced concept and stick it in there because, well, 2x plus 1 is a polynomial of degree 1, which means it lives in, like, a as a polynomial, the space of the polynomials of degree one over the reals. If you're not familiar with this uh, notation, that's what it means. This is the space, the vector space specifically, of polynomials of degree one where the coefficients live in the reals. Well, I can express that as an element. Specifically, I can express that as one, two in this polynomial space with respect to the basis one, x. This is another noun, right? It's an element of a vector space. If you think of it as a linear combination of these, then it's kind of acting like a verb again. So in your math education, depending on how far along it you are, you will have gone through the whole process of changing back and forth across these different grammatical forms for this relationship based on what you need at the time. And from each of these grammatical forms, you will pull information based on what you want to get out of this expression here. You are already some amount of fluent in y equals 2x plus 1, and you will become more fluent as you go through your maths education. I am sure all of you have some level of understanding in this, and chances are you use these sorts of language constructions even if you don't know about it, and my hope is that this little video here has helped make that process a lot more explicit for you.